Welcome to All Write in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian, Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair, and me, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker. recording takes place in Greater Detroit. Today we're welcoming Doreen O'Brien, who is a Detroit-based creative writing teacher and writer. Her stories have won the Red Rock Review Mark Twain Award for Short Fiction, the Nelson Algren Award, the New Millennium Writings Fiction Prize, and the International Bridport Prize. She has won fellowships from the NEA and the Vermont Studio Center. Her work has appeared in the Baltimore Review, Madison Review, the Chicago Tribune, Montreal Review, and many others. Voices of the Lost and Found, her first fiction collection, won the USA Best Book Award for short fiction. Her second full-length collection, What It Might Feel Like to Hope, released in 2019 by Baobab Press, was named first runner-up in the Mary Roberts Reinhardt Fiction Prize and won a gold medal in the 2019 Independent Publishers Book Awards, Ippy. The stories take place in Detroit and small towns in the Upper Midwest, and they've been described as gritty. They feature characters ranging from a tarot card reader who schemes to save Detroit from blight and casinos, to a research scientist whose Alzheimer's diagnosis leads him to find new meaning in the crystals he can no longer study. So welcome to Aureen. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. You've been winning awards and accolades for your writing since the late 1990s, and you still don't call yourself a writer. Why is that? I think being a writer is a long apprenticeship. The industry is constantly evolving, and I'm constantly learning, and every book I write teaches me something new. So when I meet writers that call themselves writers, wrongly probably, I feel sometimes they're a little arrogant. I think that title has to be earned. I don't know if I'll ever feel like I have, but I think there's so much to learn that I... I'm not confident calling myself a writer. I would never put that on my tax form. Hmm. (laughs) What would it take to call yourself a writer? Would you give up your day job? Would you win the Nobel? Yes, and yes. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) You know, even I have limits. I would certainly, um, winning a Nobel Prize would help me to quit my full-time job. Um, I think the accolades that come in should make me more confident than I've been. I think a lot of writers feel this way. I feel like it's always up for grabs. I sometimes feel that with my next book, readers are going to see that I'm a fraud, that I've just, you know, my, I've used up all of the coins of my creative fortune and the well is one run dry. And I think it's because more than anything, I want to be a writer. And if I'm not that, I don't feel there's anything left. And so I'm very careful with it. I'm very probably too insecure about it. But it's all that I really want to be. And so I just keep striving to be better. So it drives you on. It definitely drives me. It's the combination between imposter syndrome and meaning. Yeah, so <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I think For me, the best writers and the writerly friends I have, we have these conversations and they all feel the same way. I don't know if they'll admit it, but I think most of us feel like we had a certain amount of talent, we've used it up in these books, will we be able to sustain that? Will we be able to write another good book? I I think people think that once you write a book or two or three, you're on your way. You can sit down and just churn out a book with very little thought and very little apprehension but we start over with every book, and every book teaches us how to be a new or different type of writer. And so I tell my students, I'm as intimidated as you are by that blinking cursor on the screen, but you just have to sit down and do it. Okay. Hmm. 
Well, that kind of leads into our next question. The stories in what it feel, what it might feel like to hope are set in Detroit in the upper Midwest, where it, hope can be sometimes in short supply. Mm-hmm. So what kind of role did that play, that idea of hope or beginning again? So I think readers will find that hope in this collection is really varied. There's no one really idealistic here, I don't think. Um, In fact, I did not realize I'd written a collection of stories about hope until writer friends read it, and I was looking for a thread that was woven throughout the book, and they said hope. And at first, I didn't see it. But then I realized that just getting up in the morning and leaving the house is an act of hope. And so hope doesn't have to be that idealistic positivity where we think everything is going to go well for us. These characters just staying in relationships that really aren't working or continuing. There's a, there's a couple of herbalists in the book that continue to minister to patients who are not taking care of themselves, but they continue to do what they feel is important that they do. And I think that is a good definition of hope. So hope is very subtly woven through most of these stories. Do you think a strong connection to a sense of place is essential in in good short fiction? I actually think it depends on the fiction. If we're talking about uh, the novels of, you know, someone like Faulkner, setting was everything. He set all of his novels in the same county and he many of the same characters. So I don't think setting is important in every short story. However, I do think every short story is set somewhere. And if you don't get the details right, the readers will call you out on that, and it it will undermine your authority. So I think it really depends on the setting or the story. Think about a story like Shirley Jackson's Lottery. It's not set anywhere in particular because the author wants the idea of a generic setting so readers will believe this could happen in my town this could happen anywhere so and then you have a story like to build a fire by jack london where setting is actually the antagonist where he if he's unable to build a fire in this freezing yukon weather he will die and so you know it's a difficult question because i don't think setting is important in every story but certainly it can be an antagonist in a story it can have a major role Um, And that leads us, your first book of short stories, Voices of the Lost and Found, also featured some dark and gritty storytelling. Um, What is it about that tone that speaks to you? Um, And you have mentioned in interviews that your tone shifted in this book, So, um, and it was becoming a little bit more optimistic even back then. Um, So what do you feel is the the basis of, of that turning, I suppose? Well, when I wrote that first book, um, I was probably less optimistic than I am now. I was certainly less mature than I am now. And the characters who were speaking to me at the time were very troubled. Um, I write realist fiction, so I don't write fantasy. I don't write genre fiction. So my characters, when you read about them, all of their plights, their conflicts, their circumstances should feel very real. And when the characters in that first collection spoke to me, they all felt very real. The first story is told from the perspective of a young abduction victim. The second story is about two teen boys who go on a national crime spree. Uh, I have a story narrated by a prostitute. I have a story narrated by a down-and-out Hollywood screenwriter. And these are the people that I was just most interested in, and those are the ones who were speaking to me. Part of this, I think, is I grew up in Detroit uh, at a very, in a, you know, very, um, my father was chronically underemployed. My mother was an immigrant. She didn't speak English. And we lived in a challenging area, and I think that informed my writing. There wasn't a lot of positivity and so I think that first book was cathartic for me. I was working out all of my my pain and my angst through those characters. My second book, which was a chapbook, less gritty, less dark, less um, pessimistic. And this this book, I think, what it might feel like to hope is probably the most hopeful 
because I think I've learned some security in my life circumstances and I'm able to address characters whose issues and whose concerns aren't so immediately pressing. Um, you also like to use humor in your stories, <laughs> like um, Eight Blind Dates Later. How do you balance the dark and the light? In the first book, I didn't. I don't think there's anything humorous in the first book. There's some humor in the second book. In this book, I, no offense to romance novelists, but that's not my favorite genre, and I thought it might be ripe for having some fun with. And so I actually bought a romance book, and I was reading through to try to get the feel. And so one of the things I wanted to do was some riffs on romance writing, which I did in the story, and then I realized this is a comedy. I can't get serious after that. So I didn't start it as a comedy, but any time your mother sets you up on eight blind dates, you either have to laugh or cry. And I decided that our character was going to laugh, or we were going to laugh with him or alongside him. The only other story that I wrote that is a comedy, it's not in this collection, and I set out to write a comedy, was called The Last Viking Voyage. I'm fascinated by the Vikings. And I wanted to write a story. We don't know what happened to the Vikings precisely. So I wanted to write a story that was conjecture about what it, you know the demise of the Vikings. And as I tried to write it seriously, I realized it was really boring. So then I started giving the Vikings some funny traits and some funny characteristics, and they were fighting on the longship, and, and it became a comedy. There's humor throughout, people tell me. I love some humor writers. T.C. Boyle isn't known necessarily as a humor writer, but there's so much cleverness, and I say that in the best way, in his work, and I'm a big fan, that I think perhaps I started channeling that idea that everything doesn't have to be dark to keep the reader interested or entertained or to teach them, I don't want to say teach them a lesson, but we do like to learn something from the fiction we read, and I think I realized we don't have to learn everything through grim application. So how, getting down to your specific characters, and I'm just, I'm just laughing thinking about how Vikings have retained their sense of humor through the Descendants in Shetland, and they, they have these Uphelia festivals, which aren't really proper festivals at right. all, but they just made it up to right. make winter better. Um, but so how do you choose uh, your characters, or do they choose you? And, and what kind of character fascinates you the most? Um, I think my characters choose me. I will, I will be thinking about something, and a character will suddenly start speaking to me. And the writers who write the best dialogue are those who hear characters speaking in their heads. And I, I say this in interviews, but I joke that on the first day of class, I ask my creative writing students, how many of you hear voices in your heads? And half of them raise their hands and the other half drop the class. But I think, <laughs> I think it's important that those who hear voices in their heads are the best dialogue writers because they can hear the inflection and the tone and and the, the diction that the character chooses. So I think the characters often choose me. There are a couple of stories I've written that I've never read at readings because I can't. I can hear the accents, I can hear the dialect, but I can't read them because I can't do those voices. I think it would be insulting. I think um, it, would be, it would seem like cultural appropriation, and I can't do it. One of the stories I'm thinking of is in my first book, and it's called Way Past Hagen, and it's about a young Detroit-based graffiti artist, um, a character I utterly fell in love with, and, and, and my heart was broken for him. And it's a, it's a story It won the Raymond Carver um, Short Story Award, which I was extremely proud of because Raymond Carver is one of my biggest influences. But I'm sad that I can never read that story because I would look utterly foolish and I would be utterly insulting. Unless you had a dramatic reading done or something like that. No. Not even? <laughs> no. Not even. Interesting. No. And in this collection, there's a story about three bricklayers, and they are, you know, they're not largely educated, but that doesn't mean they're not smart, and I can't really do their voices either, but I can hear their voices. So I'm most interested in characters who are down on their luck, who are blue-collar, um, a friend of mine once said, you know, people who write literary fiction, and mine would be 
called literary fiction, are typically concerned with upper middle class characters. Think of John Updike, and and I and I'm not, and I think it's because of where I grew up and the people I grew up with. Um, and a watershed moment for me was when I was 21 years old. I got a job working midnights at the post office. Prior to that, I grew up in Detroit, but in Hamtramck, which was very cult- it was very Polish. You went to the Polish Catholic school. That's what you did. And when I started at the post office, I met people from different cultures, different ethnicities, and it w- it broke my mind open because I grew up in a rather racist household and. I was never exposed to people from other cultures. And I made friends with so many people, and I got to know so many people, and I think that's really what triggered my interest in people so different than I am, but I have no interest in in wealthy people. Mm -hmm. They don't have problems. Fiction writers are interested (laughs) in characters who have problems. We need conflict for good fiction. Mm-hmm. And well, and you know M. L. Liebler, and he talks a lot about this area's fiction and poetry, and that it has that sort of voice. Do you do you find that yourself when you hang out with other writers here that it, there is a particular blue collar or um, different kind of voice that's more popular here? Definitely, uh, and I I, I I assume I can't speak for other writers that it's because of our location where we where we grew up and, and our aesthetic. Um, but that's definitely, we're the motor city, you know, we're gritty, we, the auto industry, there's a lot of writers that write about the auto industry, there's a lot of local writers who write about the local culture, and I think it's unavoidable. A story like Way Past Tagging, or in this book, there's a story called Honesty Above All Else, set in Corktown, I don't think I could have written those two stories if I didn't live in Detroit. Detroit utterly informs those stories. Okay. So short stories can be a bit of a tough sell in the publishing world these days. Why, why do they choose you as a form to work in? Um, why do the stories choose me? Or oh, why do you choose the stories? <laughs> why yeah. do I choose it? Yeah. I, yeah, I thought, well, that's, that I couldn't answer. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I'm a short story writer. Um, I want to be a novelist because the market demands it. But... I love writing short stories. Part of it, I think, is because when you finish a a story, even if it's a first draft, there's this sense of completion. And I'm elated, it's done, I can go back and, and revise, I can tinker, but it's done. A novel is a very, very, very long swim. I'd rather swim across the pool than the English Channel. Um, but... I am working on my second novel. My first novel stalled because I think I just wasn't yet s- smart enough to write that novel or ready ready enough as a novelist. Um, but short stories, I just feel like I understand what to include and what to leave out. Short stories, because they are an exercise in brevity, require you to... They're all mystery stories. You must plant the right seed so that the reader colludes with you to make meaning and so that the emptiness, the white lines, are just as charged as the text on the page. And I love that challenge. I love writing that line. A novel is such a different animal. There, there's space for digressions. There's, you, know, you can have casts of thousands. These are things you can't do in short stories. So I like that challenge. But I think I have... Um, I think I've met that challenge in many of my stories, and I am ready to turn my attention to my novel. I have finished uh, a first draft. I'm going through my second draft now, so we'll see if it goes as well as the stories have. But you're absolutely right in that the market, for some reason, does not privilege short stories. And I, I think it's because... The publishing industry is so accustomed to marketing and selling novels that it's hard for them to change their business model. But when you think about the limited, not the limited attention span of people, but all of the things calling to their attention now, we have this technology we never had before. We have tweets. There are stories that are called Twitter fic, where they're limited characters. This People love these things. Microfiction is big right now. It doesn't make sense to me that short story collections have not ridden the wave of all of this other of these other short forms that are so popular now. 
And, and you talked about the fact that you like organizing plots, well, which would help in any kind of genre of fiction that you're, you're writing. And so a lot of fi writers find this a struggle. What, what is it about you know, the plotting that appeals to you? You mentioned that every story is a mystery, and, and that's certainly true in many ways. Um, well, I like the challenge, and I say that when you first write a story, the creative person in you gets to play. And after that story is, the first draft is completed, then the scientist in you gets to play, or the architect in you gets to play. And I think it's fun to move things around. Um, how, what will best serve the story? Is this opening as compelling as maybe the third paragraph on the second page? And of course, once you move these important elements and these blocks around in your story, it's a domino effect. You have to see where that thread is picked up and... And that is very challenging. It challenges the other part of my brain. So, you know, one is the right part of the brain, one is the left part of the brain. And I think that they're both enjoyable. But you have to, um, you have to really get the creative part down before you start moving those blocks around. Hmm. Are you a sticky notes on the wall kind of person? I am. Good. <laughs> I am. Uh, I, if I could be, and I, I'm not going to do this, but... I would be that person that had 300 pages laid out on the dining room floor. Oh, that sounds like heaven, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can see it all. Yes. <laughs> so, um, will you tell us a little bit about what you're working on now? Um, if you win the lottery and you have absolutely no constraints, what's your dream project? Oh, my dream project. Well, finishing and launching the novel that I'm working on now because I've invested a lot of time in it. Um, I've got a couple of dream projects. My, If I won the lottery, and uh, my first dream project would be writing a response to John Gardner's book, Grendel. Grendel was the monster in Beowulf who attacks the Mead Hall and Beowulf kills. And John Gardner wrote a wonderful book called Grendel, and the book speaks from the perspective of the monster. You know, hu not humanizing him, but certainly giving us his side of the story, which is valid. It's always bothered me that the second battle in Beowulf is with Grendel's mother, and she's not named. She's very important. She's powerful, like her son. She's never named. She's kind of dismissed as the easiest foe to kill, and I want to write uh, a response from Grendel's mother. Cool. What a cool <laughs> idea. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Do you have a, a thing about a fishbowl? Would you like oh. to share your your um, ideas with about the fishbowl? So I have your practice? Yes, I have a I have a fishbowl at home. And when you know, I tell my students, you're young and your minds are fertile and you think because you have a great memory, you'll remember every idea that pops into your head throughout your day, and you won't. So you carry around a little notebook or, or pieces of paper, and you jot those ideas down for stories or poems or, or essays. And then what I, I do that, and then I go home and I put them in my fishbowl if I'm not ready to address them yet. There are no fish in my fishbowl. Okay. This, this is an empty fishbowl. And when I run out of things to write, which has been a long time since I have, I reach into the fishbowl and I open up the paper. And sometimes I'll read the paper and say, wow, Doreen, you are a genius. <laughs> and I'll remember what inspired that idea. And, and then sometimes I will open the paper and scratch my head and think, I must have written this when I was at the bar. <laughs> I don't remember what this means. What was I thinking? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Oh. Um, so would you like to read a little bit from your book? Absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to read from the first story in the book called Eight Blind Dates Later. And to set it up, the narrator is male. And his name is Johnny, and he met his girlfriend Shelby when she had a spin-out accident on the freeway, and she brought her car to the body shop he manages. So for around eight months, they're inseparable until she dumps him because he's reluctant to move to the next step of their relationship, and because he buys her a crock pot for Christmas. <laughs> um, Johnny's mother taking pity on him starts, much to his horror and dismay, fixing him up on blind dates with um, her friend's daughters. So, the, a short excerpt from Eight Blind Dates Later. 
When I went to my mother, she accosted me before I'd even removed my jacket. I have a thought, she bellowed. What's up, I asked as I plopped onto the kitchen chair, resigned to cold rigatoni and an unfailing exuberance that was hard to bear without Shelby beside me, smiling, encouraging my mother to share bodily emission updates, coupon savings totals, the escapades of Mr. Bojangles, a flea-bitten, imperious cat that seemed intent on disfiguring my face. You remember Mrs. Candelo, she asked. Nope, I said, can't say that I do. From the grocery store? I shook my head. Bingo? This went on for several minutes until I deduced that Mrs. Candelo had a daughter near my age who was in dire need of a date. Mom, I don't want to go on a date. Well, of course you do. I shook my head. Give me one good reason. I can give you plenty. I stared at the chip plate on the table before me, the paper napkin folded neatly under a child-sized fork, the paisley pattern in the plastic tablecloth. When her eyes met, her look carried the weight of her disappointment in my selfishness and the gross injustice to poor Alice Candelo, a nice girl with a tiny overbite who daily underwent the strain of fielding telephone complaints from angry AT&T customers. Do you know how difficult that is, dealing with irritated people? The woman's a saint. You're too good to have a cup of coffee with a saint? I'm sure she's great, I said, exhausted before I put the first bite of cold, wet noodle into my mouth. But I don't want to start anything. She's not asking for a marriage proposal, just a cup of coffee. Maybe she won't even like you, she said almost hopefully before placing a warm glass of RC Cola beside my hand and lowering herself onto the chair next to me. I'm sure she won't, I said. Oh, Johnny, you've been so negative since... Since what? Since you and Shelby broke up, I sat across the table from Alice Candelo at Finn, dark wood, musty smell, overpriced seafood, and learned that she is indeed stressed, as evidenced by the stains under the arms of her satin blouse and the speed with which she downed a $42 bottle of Merlot. She did not stop talking about implacable customers, her obstinate cockatiel, traffic on I-84 where I could not prevent the thought Shelby had once spun her car like a carnival ride. The handcuff-sized bangles on her wrist clanked each time she lifted her glass or waved to the waiter to ask for more bread, to request a less tart salad dressing, to demand he open a window as she fanned herself with a cocktail menu. After her fourth glass of wine, she'd thrown off any pretense of being on a first date, openly flirting while grinding what felt like a size 18 gumboot up and down my left shin and engaging in a strange dialect of drunken baby talk. I'm not an easily embarrassed man, but she was making a Herculean effort, even if unconsciously. By the time the main course arrived, I was mentally rehearsing what I would say to my crestfallen mother. I'm being transferred to Parma. I'm allergic to birds. I'm gay. But the utter failure of my date with Alice Candelo did not deter my perpetually upbeat mother, who apparently had a slew of friends with desperate, defective daughters. I tried to overlook Sheila Kravis's eye tick, the force with which her man hands clutched the fork and knife, sawing like a primate into the bloody steak on her plate. Recently divorced Lou N. Plug spent the evening chatting about the myriad ways she'd like her ex to suffer. Stoning. Overpass collapse. Shark attack. Stacy Kaminsky barely spoke, instead giggling like a mental patient, and Rene Dubois anxiously glanced around the restaurant like a witness protection inductee on her first outing before admitting that her former boyfriend was a stalker, but really, she said, that didn't stop him from loving her. <laughs> After five dates, I told my mother I was done, but she persisted in battling my resolve determined to whittle her list of prospective daughters-in-law to zero. When she engaged her fake limp, clutched Mr. Bojangles to her bosom, and claimed that she was not long for this world, I acquiesced. While Mona Lambers rambled on about cross-stitch patterns, I wondered if Shelby would ever take me back. When Loreen Womack ran to the restroom for the fifth time, bladder infection? Coke addiction? I wondered if I would or could change. As Patrice Dombrowski chucked oysters into her mouth like an eating contest contender, I hoped that, ultimately, Shelby would be happy.
Doreen O'Brien, thank you very, very much for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.